Hello, everyone. I'm Sean Corcoran, curator of prints and photographs here at the Museum of the City of New York. And uh, welcome to our latest installment of Curators from the Couch, our ongoing live streaming series, which pairs curators from the museum with artists, activists, and more. The conversations are usually tied to our exhibitions or, or other uh, events. I'm here today with two incredible artists, John Crash Matos and Lee Quinones. Um, we're each on our respective couches. Um, over the next 30 minutes or so, we'll talk about the museum's collection of street art and style writing um, in, and the exhibition that was drawn from that collection entitled City as Canvas. Additionally, we'll discuss what's happening on the streets of New York and around the world today. Uh, please note that over the next half hour or so, I'll probably use some interchangeable words um, to talk about work inspired by the streets. Um, I may say street art or style writing, and every once in a while, maybe I'll use the word graffiti. I try not to use that um, word too much because it's not the word that's preferred by the artists who actually create the work. Uh, a little bit of background, um, in case you didn't have a chance to see the exhibition at the museum a few years ago. Um, City of Canvas was an exhibition that was drawn from an ex expansive street art collection put, pulled together by uh, a, a, another well-known artist named Martin Wong. Martin was an East Village artist and collector of street art. Uh, he amassed a treasure trove of hundreds of works on paper, canvas, um, sketchbooks, and aerosol ink and other medium media. Uh, the collection features um, artists including uh, Lady Pink, Futura, Ramel Z, Keith Haring, and of course, Lee and Crash, um, who will be speaking with us today. All seminal figures in this artistic movement that spawned a worldwide phenomenon, altering um, pop visual culture um, and the arts in general um, over the years. The exhibition itself included more than 150 works on canvas and other media, including photographs and, um, and other, other objects long erased from New York City and buildings. Uh, Martin donated the collection to the Museum of the City of New York in 1994, and it was on view here a few years back in New York, and it has been traveling um, to a few different venues ever since. Um, FYI, there is a, a companion publication called titled City as Canvas, and we also currently have a digital field trip available for students via um, our education department. Um, but back today, today, and as I mentioned, we're talking to two pioneers of the graffiti writing movement, Ali Quinones and John Matos, about their work and about what's happening now. So I'll do a quick, quick introduction. Crash was born and raised in, Bron in the Bronx and as early as 13 was spray painting his moniker Crash on the New York City subway trains. In 1980, he curated the now iconic exhibition Graffiti Art Ses Success for America at Fashion Moda and is credited, which is credited for a pivotal moment of getting um, street art onto gallery walls. Over his career, he's been commissioned um, by many high profile brands, including Toomey, Ash Footwear, Fender, and many, many more. Uh, his work is featured in uh, museums internationally and of course locally, including MoMA, the Brooklyn Museum, and of course, the Museum of the City of New York. Um, he's currently actively painting murals around the city as well. And in 2010, he had a retrospective um, show at the Fairfield University it's a Walsh Gallery. Um, he also participated in the um, Beyond the Streets exhibition of 2019. And I should also mention, he is uh, um, showing a lot of work in the community in the Bronx at Wallworks Galleries. Uh, Lee Quinones was born in Puerto Rico and raised on New York's Lower East Side, or as Lee likes to say, the Lower Deck. I always love it when he says that. <laughs> um, and he was uh, painting on the streets and in subway cars uh, in the, the mid-1970s, and over the next decade would paint over 100 whole cars uh, before shifting to a studio-based practice. Um, he first showed canvases in Italy in 1979. Over his career, he's been uh, featured at the Whitney, the, the Museum of Modern Art, the Brooklyn Museum, Museum of the City of New York, among many, many others. I'm just mentioning the New York museums. Um, 
And Lee also participated in the Beyond the Streets exhibition in 2019. Uh, and of course, you have to mention, Lee was famously appeared in Blondie's Rapture video and in the film Wild Style, uh, among, among many other uh, star turns. <laughs> um, but thank you both for being here. I really appreciate it. And I thought we would just jump into a few questions and get the conversation going and um, see where it leads. And then eventually we'll open it up to hopefully some people that are online that might wanna ask something as well. So let's start at the beginning. Um, why don't you tell us both what, both of you, uh, maybe Lee and then, and then John, um, what inspired you to pick up a spray can and maybe tell, share your earliest memories of of writing, Lee first, please. Yes, Lee first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, first and foremost, uh, well, first and foremost, I'm not sitting on a sofa on on a wood old school wood chair, <laughs> which reminds me of the bench on 149th Street. So it's good. <laughs> um, uh, my mother had a very a uh, million dollar view outside of her windows, and I was always just staring out into the both the, the dawn and the dusk, because you could see Brooklyn all in front of you. But right in front of you, uh, directly in front of us in the, in the building um, where I lived, was a park where one day all the local young people, such as my age or older, had acquired all this paint that had, they had uh, sort of borrowed from the local heart, uh, warehouse and started painting these uh, Elias names and uh, all types of uh, just nicknames. And I was fascinated by that. Um, obviously I've been drawing all my life since I was four or five years old, but this brought back, this sort of triggered something in my mind that uh, these were young people that had their own voice um, and they, they were taking matters into their own hands and there was no direction for it, there was no. So that's what, that's what really drew me to come downstairs and join in on the party. And then I learned right there and then that this was about everybody's identity being projected and, you know, basically painted on the floor. And it was something that we were all proud of. Uh, obviously, I mean, it's a long story, but when I came back up and I looked at my strategically placed drawing that I put on the, uh, on the, on the floor that I painted on the floor, I just stared at it for days and days. And I was just so proud that I was, not only that I had created this thing with just found colors uh, at the moment, but that I was now in a conversation with many other identities. So it, it, there was a sense of community right from the get-go that I obviously uh, inherited uh, when I joined the ranks of the subway, the subway writers late, you know, shortly thereafter. So. Great, John. <laughs> um, Do you remember? I got uh, well, uh, like Lee. I was uh, as a kid. I was always drawing and painting. But um, I, you know, growing up in the projects, uh, a lot of the graffiti, you know, you just see it, and and it, it was there. I didn't realize, or I didn't take it into heart until I started going to school in the city. I was in the Bronx, but I was going down to um, the school called Mary Bertram, all the way down um, near the Lower East Side. And uh, one of the guys in my class, I was, I was 13, and I was a freshman, he had tags on his notebook that were exactly like something that I kept seeing in the mornings. So the, the, the connection was like, oh, wow, wait a minute, you know, because you see it every day, but until you see it out of its element and in front of you, it, it sort of triggers something. So um, going back home, you know, I started really, this is 1973, 74. So I was seeing a lot of, you know, things over and over and over. And then some of the older guys in my neighborhood were doing it. Um, and some of them, uh, some of the people that Lee knows, um, and, 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 you know, just making that personal connection, then, mm -hmm. you know, it just, it just drew me in. And we're all hanging out in these, uh, these little um, um, community centers in the Bronx, and they're all drawing, and they're doing the names. And I just, you know, I just started participating. Yeah. Do you remember, do you remember like the first thing, not the first thing you did, ever did, but the first thing like that you considered like 
impressive. <laughs> that, you know I mean? like, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that part out. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're too humble. You're too humble. I think, I think the, the first thing I did on the train, and the funny thing is that um, 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 Stuart has a picture of it. We, we, I was, in, I was in, in, in Rome, and he was doing a, a, a lecture, and the piece came up, and it was really ugly. It was black filling with a red outline. But this was like 1975, and it was the first thing I did. I'm like, you know, so when you do it, you think it's like it. But yeah. when I saw it there, I'm like, Lord, but, you know, that's, 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 that was the one, you know, that was it. Perspective, right? The oh, perspective. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, you guys both went on to do, um, you know, masterpieces on the subway system and, of course, had, you know, and, and masterpieces on canvas as well. But um, I'm going to uh, just add a, ask a couple um, specific questions to each of you and maybe um, get us going in a couple different directions and, and, and for, push us forward. But um, a, lot of, a lot of graffiti writing, or at least New York style graffiti writing, we, people don't think of it as being politically um, or socially conscious, just and maybe you know, and there there are mot different motivations for everybody who's writing, and you can't ascribe you know motivations to really an overall motivation to anybody. But in particular, Lee, I've I, I know there are several um, pieces that you did that were politically conscious or socially conscious, including the Stop the Bomb and a few others. Um, so I'm just wondering how that kind of, how, how you, you know, like whereas many, a lot of people, and you did just do your name, but then you went on to do these other things. So I'm wondering if you might want to talk a little bit about, you know, what drove you to, to do those pieces. Well, it's a multifaceted thing. I mean, uh, it, it was wheels turning at that time, you know, in my head. Uh, one, one in particular was the post-Vietnam War environment that I, um, that I was witnessing around me, hearing around me, seeing on TV. Um, and that always made me curious about ask the, you know, ask questions against the status quo. Like, why did that event happen? So, because it was very riveting to me as a young boy to be aware of it on TV. Uh, I think I might have even seen first visuals of the war in 67, 68, um, and just wondered what that was all about. And at one point, I actually sort of um, explained to myself, as I couldn't get an explanation from any grown up at that time, including my father, who was in World War II, of what this was about. And I thought it was a passage of. Uh, rites of passage for young men uh, to go to this theatrical um, experience called war. And that if you, but it was very real that if you made it out, then you were, uh, you could live on. But if you didn't, you just was a casualty of that war. So that spooked me for days on end, uh, including also the Cold War, the, uh, the various, um, um, rituals that we went through in school in the early 60s uh, when I was in Catholic school at that time where you had to go on your desk when the, the you know the, 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 the bells rang parade drills yeah so, yeah you know fallout shelter bells and stuff so um, that was spooky and I just started putting that all together along with getting bored with the narcissistic uh, act of painting your name over and over and over again. And I just felt that when I had reached a certain plateau of uh, asking myself, well, what's my name, you know, where does it belong and why is it so important to me? Why can't the narrative around the work be more important to a more open society like the writing public of the subway train? So the writers were one thing and I kept away from, from most of them for obvious reasons um, and it wasn't it was a strategy it wasn't like some kind of uh, act of uh, you know just some kind of glamorous uh, uh, you know act of mystery it was a strategic uh, reason why I was keeping away from most writers at the time 
because I knew that I was going to do a lot of this and that I was in dangerous ground by painting things that question the status quo and question government and question religion and question uh, morals in the family structure and things of that nature. So I, I, I knew at that point at 17, more or less, that I was uh, more than just a graffiti writer, bomber, whatever. I was going to a whole different um, arena. And uh, I, was I felt self-challenged by that. And, I, and that's what kept me going. I was like, I want to talk about what people are mumbling under their lips while they're reading the Times or the Wall Street Journal. But when they pull that paper down, they see this car come by and it reminds them that someone young at heart and spirit and body is painting about the very same subjects that we're, we're all haunted by. Um, yeah. so I thought that there was more power to that because there was I was reaching an audience beyond the 50, 30, 50,000 young souls that were painting trains that I was reaching 4 million ridership at that time. Yeah. Yeah, um, along kind of similar lines, uh, I think it, for John, I, I think it's really important to note um, how active you are in the community today. Um, not just, not I mean, and not just, I say that now, and it, you mean you have a gallery in, in the Bronx that is kind of an open door for the community. You're showing work that um, is, you know, in some in some cases, you're giving people chances to show that 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 don't have much opportunity. But you're basically you have a you have a a, a real open door to the community, and and you yourself and uh, members of the Taz crew or and, and and others are doing a lot of murals in the community. So I wanted to ask you, kind of like, do you see do you see that kind of community as a, an extension of? you know, what you were doing in the 70s and 80s? And, and you know, what are your, you know, just kind of like, where do you hope, where do you hope that goes in the future? Uh, that's, that's a loaded question because it, it's, it, um, <laughs> where the gallery is, it's, it's, it's um, the people, it, it, you know, the, it's, um, it fluctuates and mm. people come and go. Um, that area, it's just, it's always been that way. Um, it, I mean, I, I want to piggyback a little bit of, of, on what Lee was doing because um, a lot of stuff that um, he was doing and a couple of other people um, made such a, a, a difference to, um, to a lot of us. And um, James Rosenquist, you know, when, when he commented about graffiti, it was like seeing a, a, was a, a fresh bouquet of flowers from South America on the subways. You know, things like that just opens your head up. Um, we weren't as political as Lee, but we realized that there's something more to it than mm -hmm. what it was. And that's why we started going into another direction. And um, um, then we take that, you know, into today where there aren't as many opportunities for young kids um, to be able to take a chance and show because it doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we were fortunate because we were at a, at a, at a point when 1980 was, I think, was was pivotal. Things just started just changing. You know, the whole system of life started changing, and people realized that um, the prophets that were writing on the subway walls were doing more than just prophesizing. You know, there was something more to it, and people started realizing that what we were saying and doing was true, and it carried. And to today, you know, what 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 we've helped establish is, is so global and it's and so, you know, so um, life-changing, you know. And then the, gal you know, the gallery is just a part of that. You know, I mean, we opened up the space with the idea of showing local people, but also people that we knew from around the world that don't have a chance to show in New York. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. Fashimoto <laughs> started that. Fashimoto started that, that idea and then when they closed, that was gone. Um, ABC No Rio, you know, all, all those all those places disappeared or changed. And we wanted to bring that back a little bit. So when mm -hmm. we opened the space, we weren't going to make any money. I, I, I knew that I was going to lose money, but there was a reason that that had to be done. So we took the chance. And it actually backfired because we actually started selling pieces 
<laughs> and bringing local people in. And, and they realized that what we were doing is the exact same thing that was happening downtown. So they, you know, they, they stuck with us um, and, you know, the conversation started turning and, you know, and the kids today are so political. You know, they're so into what's going on that it's like going back in time a little. I'm like, this is kind of impressive. And, you know, the paintings, whatever they are, you know, it's, it's a double conversation because we just want to do what we want to do. They're doing what they want to do, but they also have something that goes on that's deeper. Yeah, so, agenda, um, agenda, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it, I see it. And I'm like thrilled by it because they're not home watching. They are, they are participating. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah. Well, I have to say, if I, I'll add to John, what John was saying, uh, a movement such as this, um, there are times where we may not be aware of our trajectory of what we're doing at the given moment. Because whenever you're creating history, you don't think about history. You're just creating mm -hmm. things. You're not referencing history. You're not trying to make history. You're just working within the moment. This, mural, this, this movement is basically based in communal, uh, like um, murals. And murals are big splash celebrations of something, of a voice, and many voices in some cases. And when whole cars and entire walls and handball courts started to become the norm, I think that that's when people within the movement, such as John and such as many others that um, started to say, you know, this is bigger than all of us combined and, and that our voice is more elastic than, than what we think it is in a little box of subways. You know, yeah. we can still play in the sandbox with our trains and stuff like that and have those stories to tell, but this has grown and matured into a major movement like most art movements do. They start in a greasy spoon, diner or in a smoky bar, cigar bar somewhere or in someone's backyard over a fight or over something. And, and then all of a sudden it just spawns and breaks out um, into something bigger than itself. And, I, and, and, you know, I think we all wanted to have community, whether it was within ourselves, our own peers, or have outside forces get involved in the conversation. So like what happened at Fashion Motor and several other alternative art spaces, it was about creating new round tables because everything was becoming too square. Mm -hmm. So, and too, uh, you know, just, it just didn't, it was uh, preventing people from having a broader discussion. So this movement was made uh, by virtue of its nature. It was made to be loud and, and spread out. So um, it's a beautiful happening organically. It's, it's just the way yeah. things should go. But movements are about moving, moving yeah. up and well, moving on to new subject matter and new challenges and uh, maybe even some failures in between. But that's what makes you get up again and do it again and, and again and better. I, I had some oh, other wait, questions, well, but, well, but- Let me just, just real quick. Um, Lisa yeah. said something interesting that uh, it, was, it was a round table and that's exactly what happened. I mean, you had, all the artists, I want to say, I mentioned a couple of names like Jane Dixon, Charlie Ahern, who were part of Collab. And when they were functioning at Fashion Moda, they never talked down to us. You know, we had an equal um, um, seat at the table and we spoke and they listened to us intently. I mean, yeah. it, it wasn't just, you know, all oh, these young kids. No, I mean, yes, graffiti is a young person's thing because it's angst, it's, you know, his anxiety is, is driven by energy, but we but they saw that there was something beyond the energy that was that was happening. That there was something that we had to say. Lee was more provocative because it was straightforward. We were a little more subversive, but at the end of the day, um, it's the same conversation. Mm -hmm. And they understood this. And and all of them, um, you know, Joe Lewis, all of them, they gave us an equal footing in that conversation. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was, I, I thought it was just, you know, brave of them. Definitely. Well said. Um, given, given what you what you guys have both been saying, I'm going to jump to what was going to be my last question, which is <laughs> about what's happening now. Um, because there's so much happening on the streets in the, over these last several months. 
Uh, John, you had a couple great quotes in the Times not too far, not too long ago. <laughs> but um, but I'm just kind of curious about you know what you think about what's going on, like you know not just not just in Soho because there's a lot of stuff happening in Soho and, and sanction. You know the common kind of combination between the sanctioned murals and the illicit stuff that's happening. I'm just kind of curious about what what you guys are, are thinking about this stuff. Why that Lee? <laughs> wow. Well, you know, um, I think, um, you know, I was very proud to be part of um, the project. Johnny was in, a part of it and many of our peers uh, at Coney Island, um, mm -hmm. the Coney Island walls that was uh, curated by Jeffrey Deitch mm -hmm. and uh, uh, financed by, um, I forget his name. Four, four equities. Yeah. Four. four. Yes. The Thor equities, yes, exactly. Um, uh, I recreated a wall that I had uh, created in 1979, and uh, I was a little stuck in a stuck in the mud in the quicksand, if you, if you want to call it that, about what kind of concept I wanted to bring to that very joyous, you know, wonderful place we know as Coney Island. We have a lot of memories, good and bad, there. Um, but I, I wanted to bring something. And my wife mentioned to me, she said, you know, Lee, just bring something back that was just so joyful to you back in the day. And what is something that you're very celebrative about? And I was like, you know, when I announced in that handball wall, Graffiti 1979, it was an announcement of like, we as a group had arrived. Shortly before that, I had arrived as an artist to myself when I created the first ones in 1978. But in 79 was we as a movement have arrived. Mm. And what I wrote on top of that wall, I felt needed to be of the times now. And I love sayings. I love fairy tales and things of that nature. And, you know, we've all heard choose your battles. Yeah. Right. Wisely in some in most cases, hopefully. So I said, you know, if the battle chooses you, which it is, it's choosing us now, then battle what, you, then choose what you battle with. Mm -hmm. And if you have to battle with the, 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 the strength and the power of art, as I've always believed that art is the true fine print that tells you the truth about things, mm -hmm. then use that as your weapon because people read into that much more powerfully than hearsay and, you know, everything that we're distracted and attracted to. And I think that when someone is very sincere to say something strong enough to give you a push out the door onto the streets, um, then that's what I felt that was appropriate for that time. Because I, I, like John said earlier, a lot of these young souls, and I don't like to say kids, I have to say guys, because kids, seem to most people to be kind of like misdirected and not knowing what, and not, you know, wet behind the ears and stuff. And that's good. Mm -hmm. Young souls that always want to change the world have the power, the power to create an art form such as this for young people of all ages. Yeah. I love that. And self-conscious, right? They know what they, they, they have it, their purpose, right? They have purpose and, and what's coming out on the streets all over the world now is amazing. It's very, it's very influential, it's inspiring. Um, and uh, I'm proud to see what, I, what, what, what these silent minds are now erupting. It's an eruption of passion and culture and, and this necessity of voice in these yeah. times. So, yeah. I mean, a lot of the stuff that's happening down the street um, because, you know, it, it's, it's, there's so many different things you have, you have the lockdown of pandemic, people are just locked in, mm -hmm. so you have that, that enthusiasm, that, that energy bubbling, but then you also have the political, what's going on, you have people being detained because they're illegal, and, um, um, you know, wintertime for us, you know, we always hit the, the, the yards or the tunnels, you know, so, so when something happens like this, it's like, you're, it's like you're attacking brand new, so you're going at it, so all this stuff, it's just, you know, all this craziness, you have so much energy and these kids are just busting out. And right. that's what's happening throughout the city. And I, I mean, to a certain extent, right, all these all these barricaded storefronts are like those when like those clean trains, right? They're just waiting yeah. for somebody to write a message on them. Yeah. You know? Yes. 
Uh, well, <laughs> I was going to like ask you about like transition to studio practice and all this stuff, but <laughs> it kind of, you know, seems uh, almost irrelevant in, in some. In well, some I think for, for both of us, um, the transition is just going from inside, from outside to inside. Cause I think we paint the same way, whether it's on a wall or, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the mindset is the same. The, 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 the imagery might be different. Mm -hmm. We paint the same way, you know. It's just... Yeah, you know, I have to say that um, just taking a temperature reading of society, as I, you know, I, I people watch just as much as I watch pigeons on the street. I love pigeons. <laughs> I think they're funny. Um, I love people too. I'm excited by them. I'm sometimes disappointed uh, by them, but it's fascinating to watch unfold in front of you. I haven't seen a time as intense as it is now where penmanship has come back, yep. where people have this, this dire, this, this, this intense yeah. need to express themselves in the fastest way they can, whether it's, it's with a it's kind of or yeah. even, a, you know, whatever it is, like, because this movement is so urgent and so necessary that this is exactly what we, or at least I, for myself, this is what I felt in 1974, 75, as I was transitioning into those trains in a hard way. I was like, this is urgent. I need to identify, I have an old saying, everybody loses their ID every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, you know, we all have to find our ID. Mm -hmm. Whether in a metaphorical, you know, spiritual way, we have to find. Right now, I think young people know that their ID and their trajectory is all hinging on what they say and do and write right now. Mm -hmm. So, and I couldn't say that more passionate than I just did because um, young people do know what's up and they do have a... Uh, they have an inkling. They have an intuitive uh, look to the future, you know, and 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 in their present time too. And I'm very proud of many minds that are coming now. And I, I would not. I will. We need to change the script, flip it, and we need to be aware of the power of voting. Be aware of our environment and the creatures that are amongst us as well. And. Um, and how we can turn that conversation again, yeah. turn it around and have everybody included. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree a thousand percent. I mean, and what's funny is um, a lot of these young people um, weren't, weren't listened to. Now they're being heard. Mm -hmm. I think Sweet we are gonna open it up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you guys. I think we want to open it up to a few questions for from the audience. Okay. Is that right? Yeah, we have a few from Facebook. Um, we have uh, Stuart Chase, who is kind of a fun one to start off with. Uh, New York City versus Miami. What differences or similarities do you see? <laughs> the weather. <laughs> um, Great. That's a good one, Johnny. I love it. <laughs> in terms of the style, in terms of... I don't understand. I think just the style. It's that's the. Um, it's different. It's different. Um, and and the reason why I say it's different is um, you know I I, I always equate things with music and sports. Miami has weather, really good weather year round. New York, you can only paint six months out of the year. So places like that, usually they're more advanced than we are in certain things like baseball. Um and sometimes outdoor work. Um, the early, early muralists, like from Mexico, you know, they, they, they set those standards so high. Um, and we look at them like, wow, we can't compare to that. Miami has the same, the same thing where some of the murals are just out, out, of, out of this world, absolutely out of this world. Our stuff is a three hour window, they have a 12 hour window to paint. Mm -hmm. It's very different. Well, if you're talking about the Wynwood theater of operations, if I want to call it that. Um, Wynwood, where the majority of the major murals are being done, um, I'm sure that there's many in other sectors of Miami, Dade, and all the other counties. Um, 
there, there is a sense of like center stage at Wynwood, right? So everybody, even a lot of New Yorkers and uh, people from LA and Chicago and Atlanta and Boston and you name it, come down to Wynwood to showcase their, 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 their craftsmanship or whatever. I mean, I don't think, I mean, there's great, there's greatness in competition. There yeah. really is. And I think that in that competition, there's a sense of camaraderie like we had back in 75 and 85. And, you know, you, you wanted to outdo and upstage the next person. And that made for great work yeah. and great new language and uh, being thrown into the mix. It's like bringing, it's like making a pot of beans and forgetting to put in the pique, right? So you bring the pique to the table, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started on food, but anyway, I think it's a good, it's a good uh, competitive um, food fight. That's what it I, is. Yeah, I agree. I, I love it. I mean, whenever when you get people together and there's and there's this that friendly that friendly competition where and, and it just makes everything rise. It's 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 fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Hmm. Okay, um, Sean. This one is, uh, I think. For you, uh, it's from Twyla. Is MCNY promoting graffiti on public spaces? No, we we are we're we're an institution that is um, we we are looking primarily at the material from the past as a, as a as a factual moment in New York City history um, where young people went out onto the streets and expressed themselves. Um, some of it was done with permission. Some of it was not done with permission. Um, what we have in the collection is all works on canvases. And what we are trying to do is um, tell the story of New Yorkers and the, these, and particularly from the Martin Wong collection and, and, the, and the historical material, um, it, is, is, it is an integral story of New York City in the 70s and 80s. So it's a legitimate subject of what our museum's mission is. Uh, in terms of today, no, we're not promoting the idea of going and writing on um, someone else's property, um, but it is something that is happening in the public sphere. And again, part of the conversation of what life in the city is. I guess that's my answer. I mean, if you guys wanna have an opinion on it, you can as well. You got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then just one final question. Uh, this is from Liz. Uh, what do you both have coming up? Uh, any exhibitions or outdoor projects? <laughs> well, everything's right now. Take take a little bit. Yeah. You want to take the podium, John? Pandemic. You know, everything's. You know, I mean, both of us we do a lot of traveling, so there have been some trips that had to be postponed. No, there's like a thousand more. Was postponed. Um, so you know, we just. We're just treading water a little bit. I'm um, I'm proud to announce that um, I've been working on this book since 1979, <laughs> uh, but I'm working on this book very diligently now to tell all tales from the rails. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm very proud to be part of a, a major exhibition coming up at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, which will open hopefully if the right if the world writes itself by this fall. Uh, another show in Hong Kong, uh, oh, K11 yeah. Foundation, um, um, several other major museum uh, projects uh, that I can't mention at the, at this moment. Um, but uh, that's that's a, a, a major bright spot in my future. Um, so. Uh, just keeping the the brushes wet and the wheels turning, and uh, curiosity will not kill this cat. So uh, I um, I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward to collaborations for the first time um, for, with selected artists that you know. There's many that I love, and some that I'm handpicking. So those will be coming in the coming shows. Uh, including one uh, at Charlie James in Los Angeles later on in 2021. Great. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one more or are we going to end it there, Tara? 
There's time for one more if you want it. Uh, sorry, I there are more um, <laughs> that I can ask. Um, how long does it take to complete most of your murals? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can even answer that and that there are many different varieties, right? It's like some some are like the the quick the quick ones and some of them are like a whole day, right? I would or more. Okay. That... Well, it, it takes as long as I want to torture myself <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with the amount of uh, too much um, maybe I wouldn't I shouldn't say too much thinking, but I love staring at my work or even, even at my work before it's even there. So I could spend loads and loads of time on a mural or a painting on canvas uh, because I'm really ingesting, I'm sort of like infesting the work with my thoughts. So it could take a lot longer than it did back in 1978 where I would do one whole car in eight hours or less. So it gives- I, like, I like to um, try and complete whatever I'm doing in a day, I, want, I always like to bring that, that, that element of, of speed. Like, you know, we only had a certain amount of hours to do something. So every time I do something, I, I try to work in that parameter. Many times I have to come back the next day and finish it, but I really like to try and do that because it shows, you know, the, what, what we used to do. You know, like, like you, you're, you're limited, you only have 10 cans, let's pull it out. <laughs> Funny story with John and Days, 1995, uh, Hanover, Germany. Crash kept coming to me like every other day. Lee, you still working in that corner? I'm like, John, oh, just go gosh. home and get some sleep. I'm like, he's, I finished my whole side of the, I was like, great, but I'm here in this corner. <laughs> I was like, he's so quick. And I was in one corner for like three days. <laughs> we were there 21 days, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In fact, he flew to New York and he called me. Yo, you still working? Yeah, I'm still working. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I think we're going to end it there. Yeah, it's 45 minutes. It's probably probably good time to cut off the questions. Um, mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to um, do my parting shots here and uh, say... Hey, thanks everybody for being here and participating. Um, thanks for the crew at the, the museum for, for setting this up and, and really making it making it all possible. Um, you know, we, we the museum has, this is an ongoing series, right? And so the museum has a, a number of, of upcoming events. Of course, we got to kind of push some of the, the, the other things happening uh, at the museum virtually. Um, through this series. And on August 20th, we have at uh, 1.30, we have a conversation between the Puffin Foundation curator uh, for social activism, Sarah Seidman, talking about women and activism tied to the upcoming anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Oh. Um, we want to, should you be in the area of the museum, we want to encourage you to stop by because we have an outdoor installation called New York Responds, which is now open. And it's on view on our terrace. Um, and it's um, images that uh, are responding to um, the, the images that have been submitted with the hashtags COVID Stories NYC and Activist New York. So you'd see um, images on, on right on Fifth Avenue relating to um, the, the city's response to the, co the, the current pandemic and the activism um, that's currently happening around Black Lives Matter and the response to George Floyd's murder. Um, so please, if you are in the area, it's worth stopping by. Um, on August 18th, uh, our mutual friend, uh, Jeanette Beckman, will be doing a live se session um, on photographing city life as part of the MCNY Kids programming. On August 19th, from 7 to 9 p.m., we're going to have our virtual block party uh, returning, um, done in coordination with the East Harlem neighbors, uh, El Museo del Barrio, the Africa Center, and the uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And our mutual friend, Fab Five Freddy, is gonna be the guest host that night. And then finally, on the 26th of August, 
Um, we have our next Moonlight and Movies virtual screening, and that's going to feature the Dominican Dream, a conversation with basketball phenom Philippe Lopez and film director Jonathan Hawk. So awesome. hope you guys will check that out. Of course, if you forget any of this stuff, it's all available on our museum's website. Um, so you can, you can kind of check in later there. And finally, before we go, um, we, when we close down, we have an exhibition up called Who We Are, which was focusing on the importance of the census. Yeah. And as we come to the closing days of the census, we want to remind everybody that if you haven't already, it's important to go online and, and, yeah. and make sure you're recorded for the census. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you can go to 2020census.gov and, and fill it out if you haven't already. Mm. Okay, that's it for me. Again, thanks everybody for being here. Thank you to John. Thank you to Lee. Thanks Absolutely. to the museum team. Really appreciate the conversation. Everybody, have a good afternoon. All right, guys. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> go Mets. Go Mets. <laughs> Bye. 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 All right, guys. <laughs> All right.